Yeah, second wind is my boat right now. It's a Kaiser Gale Force 34. There's only about 25 of them made, um, which barely made uh, made the rules of what is allowed in this race. Um, so when I was searching for boats and once I sold my last boat, I only had a little bit of money and I knew the next step up a 32 to 36 foot boat, which is what was needed for the race, um, was going to be a lot more expensive. And then eventually I ran across a friend who, um, was willing to donate a boat up to a certain cost. And that was pretty mind blowing and, um, very humbling. And, um, yeah, so I started to begin searching all over the East Coast, essentially driving up and down the van, looking at, you know, a bunch of different boats. And I never really felt totally right about any of them. And then I saw this model, the Gale Force, and I was obsessed. And I was like, I have to get this type of boat. It's so beautiful. And I, I just really liked the lines on it. And then um, it fell through. The one I found fell through. And I was really pretty bummed. And feeling uninspired and then a few weeks later the broker calls me and says hey i found there's another gale force that just popped up for sale you're never gonna believe it it's in virginia like you gotta go see it so i drove up there and i called the owner on the way and um i'm getting all excited about it and um yeah and so that was in my mind flashback um, in high school, I actually lost my mom due to a uh, lung disease and an unknown one at the time. And, um, in honor of her, when I was 18, I got a tattoo saying the second wind, um, kind of just the idea of that she pushed on uh, us as kids and family that you don't get your second wind until you give everything. Um, and that's emotionally, physically, spiritually, you know, everything. So that's kind of what that was for me. So I'm driving up to see this boat, you know, last summer. And, and I, for some reason, it, it just totally slipped my mind to even catch the name of the boat. And then I call him like, Oh yeah. And like, we're catching up. And I was like, and what's the name of the boat? And he's like, Oh yeah, it's the second wind. And I was like, Oh my gosh. I was just like totally taken back. And I, you know, it's just a crazy sign. And there's been so many ones like that and some of them smaller and some bigger. Um, that have really humbled me and, you know, kept me going even when times have sucked and been really hard. But, um, yeah, that's the, that's the origin of the name. Pretty cool. So, so this boat, Second Wind, um, what have you needed to do to, to prepare it for this race? Yeah. Being so excited about <laughs> the name of the boat and feeling like it was destiny. Um, I managed to overlook a lot of problems on it. Um, yeah. Oh, like a significant amount. And, you know, at the time I was like, I know what I'm looking for, for and everything, but I really didn't. <laughs> I never totally refitted a boat on my own. I've only like helped with other people's and my old boat was already beat the, you know, beat the heck. So I just kept beating it up anyways. Didn't really fix a lot of things that weren't important at the time. So being in the Southern ocean for this race, for most of it, it's pretty brutal place. So it had to be, you know, absolutely perfect. Um, so the work I've had to do is extensive from repairing rotting bulkheads, um, which are structural to the boat, um, to replacing every single, every single hose, every wire and the whole boat has been ripped out and replaced. Um, which is actually a lot harder than you think because <laughs> it's not like you just punch a hole in the wall and all the wires you can rip out. It's tucked away, sometimes glassed inside the boat. It's pretty insane, but yeah, just a bunch of repairs structurally and um, a lot of small stuff as well that go along with it. Yeah. And are you doing a lot of those repairs yourself or do you have people that come by and kind of donate their time or offer their help? Yeah, I've done pretty much everything myself except for, I have been getting help from people donating their time. Um, I have a friend in town that I met randomly and he's a marine electrician, which has become extremely handy um, to do it the right way. And, you know, approved by Coast Guard regulations, which is pretty important versus my old hack job way of doing electrical work. Um, so then I've had, you know, multiple friends and family that have come by and, you know, volunteered a day of, 
doing things, but it's pretty much me directing and doing it all and every day. Yeah. Yeah. So the boat needs a lot of special preparation to, to survive this, the, the journey here. And that's the, the route that you take. Yeah, exactly. So it goes south through the Atlantic. I have to round the Trinidad, not Trinidad, Trinidad Islands off of Brazil in the middle of the uh, South Atlantic. And then I go eastward under every continent and then back up um, the Atlantic, which is pretty wild. <laughs> That's nonstop. Yes. Um, there's three checkpoints. There's one, um, you can see Cape Town photo gate. Uh, so we have to pull into South Africa. Um, we don't actually go on land. Nobody gives us things. We don't exchange anything except for media. Um, I'm allowed to drop off any film that I take or any, you know, 35 millimeter, six super eight, whatever I'm shooting. And um, I'm allowed to FaceTime family and friends. And then same with Australia and then on the other side of South America as well. They just added that gate. So I don't really know that much about it, honestly. So you can only use technology that was prior or up to 1968, the first Golden Globe race. Um, right. So what sort of tech and equipment have you been, have you been accumulating along this, this journey that you need to, to use on this trip? Being that only 1968 technology and then, um, yeah, it's a lot, you know, sextants, barometers, uh, chronometers, um, charts, tons of paper charts, which I don't have really any still that are up to date and, um, for what I need, but thankfully I'm out in open water most of the time. So I don't need like exact detailed charts of every town along the coast somewhere. Um, so that's been fun accumulating those things. Uh, it's, you know, you'd think it'd be cheap, but it's probably more expensive than modern technology, really. Um, Where do you get it, that kind of old technology? Yeah, I've just found it online and also um, through friends and sailors exchange off the street. Um, it's got some gold in there sometimes, yeah. but yeah. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate because not only do I have to have that, but I also have to have the modern technology for emergency um, use, which is required on the boat. Right. As I was going to ask next, um, in case of emergencies, you know, because it's a one-way trip, a very long trip, what, what do you have to do to prep for emergencies? Yeah, I have to take two courses. Um, I still have to take, um, they're basically Coast Guard approved courses of safety and emergency medicine use, um, and one at sea as survival at sea. Um, so I have to have four person life raft that's approved, um, to a certain caliber, um, you know, anything from flares to, you know, emergency water desalinators, um, <clears throat> beacons to finding like tons of different radio and satellite phones. Um, those are pretty interesting and I've never really used some of the technology, but, um, yeah, I think it's all pretty simple, yeah. but very important to have. Yeah, and for the, the old technology, like you said, um, have you had to learn any special skills, like navigating the stars, a anything that maybe isn't a tool, but you just had to, to learn that they used back then? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Navigating in general is something I'm still uh, working and always can get better at. Um, there's different processes um, that sailors will use from dead reckoning you know onwards um but i'm pretty familiar with the, that side but the celestial navigating is something i started to pick up when i didn't have the boat so i figured i can work on something um you know without you know the boat and get better at that so i kind of put that down since i've got the boat plotting a you know a fixture is something i can do it just takes me a little while um so what is yeah. that plotting of fixture can you explain that yeah essentially you use a sextant which is a glorified protractor and you have to measure um from the angle distance from a celestial body like a star or the moon or the sun um and to the angle to the horizon and then you basically get that no very exact number um, plug it into a bunch of equations and then eventually out pops your uh, latitude and longitude coordinate. 
and you said you learned a little bit about celestial navigation. Um, what's how, when you first started? What were some of the things that you learned? Really, I was just going through the basics of like terminology at first, um, and then going into like just the rhythm of because it's like a forty-five minute ordeal at first. And, you know, people it probably longer for me, honestly, to do it all correctly, but. Um, you know, people get it down to 20 and five minutes now. Um, but it just takes a while. And I noticed on your website, um, you have, I think two advisors. Mm -hmm. What, what role do they play? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Vanya, who actually is one of the, is the guy who supplied the boat. Um, he's just been like really helpful in trying to get other things organized for me we're trying to do a couple of fundraisers up north where he lives in massachusetts um he's also been an avid sailor his whole life growing up on uh the mary mack river in massachusetts um and i actually met him in the bahamas um a few years ago on my old boat and then randy who was one of my captains in san francisco who basically taught me how to sail um he has been instrumental just calling him for advice he has done so much sailing uh it's incredible and same with my other captains who i just call regularly when i have a question like how do i fix this like i don't i don't even know what this does like and they're like how do you not know what that does so i'm like oh, i don't know i guess i've never used it um but yeah so basically just calling them and asking for help or guidance um, um and when do you ship out i'm trying to leave the end of may um slash first week of june uh, before hurricane season and um yeah it's a wise decision i know so this race being that it's solo mm -hmm. it's non-stop um what and, and the technology restrictions um what kind of entertainment are you bringing up to yourself say? um books <laughs> <laughs> yeah lots of books um unfortunately there can be heavy and my space is a little limited you know, considering I have to carry up to nine months of food on board, um, which takes up a lot of space and all that emergency equipment and, you know, every, all the sales and backup lines, every, you know, all those things. So books, um, we are allowed to bring cassettes. So um, I'm always able to uh, collect cassettes from anybody that's, you know, throwing them out. I'm happy to sort through them and see. So what about, exercise like physically preparing yourself for this kind of thing. Any exercise regimens uh meditation anything to mm. just physically and mentally prepare yeah i used to meditate pretty regularly um along with doing yoga um which is pretty instrumental to my mental health i found um and i definitely suggest it for anybody all the time movement is key to living and so I haven't been practicing it as much as I want to, just being so busy um, every day working on the boat or working for somebody else to raise funds. And, um, and then the rest of my time I spend with my partner. So, <clears throat> yeah, but luckily she also does meditate and yoga. So I'm able to kind of slip in there when she's doing that every now and then. So you have um, a partner here who will be waiting for you at the finish line? Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I need to do one more qualif qualifying uh, sail with this boat. Um, and that's a 2,000-mile sail. Um, so I need to do that first. So I'm considering sailing from down here to the Azores nonstop solo and then so that way I have like a good breakdown of the boat and get that qualifying sail and then maybe fly her or whoever wants to come to sail from Azores to France. Um, just so I can do a little bit of not solo because it's a long solo, you know, six weeks and then to get on the boat and then go another six months. Yeah. Um, so I might as well get my people time in if I can. Yeah. Um, so while you're out there on the ocean, um, how will you spend most of your time? Like, will it be just kind of cruising, maybe reading books, or will you be pretty much like working on the boat and watching where you're going most of the time? 
Yeah, thankfully, I'll, I'll have an autopilot on the boat, not an electronic one, but a wind pilot. Um, they're called wind vanes, and they work mechanically uh, with the wind. And so really, I, I won't be hand steering hardly at all, uh, is the you know, hope. <laughs> yeah, hands, when you start to, when I figured out self-navigate or self-steering on my old boat, it was the most freeing experience feeling you could actually enjoy sailing at that point including reading and riding and right. you know just looking and yeah taking it all in <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah um yeah um, so the, the autopilot will that help because you'll be alone how will you handle sleeping will you just turn on the autopilot and head down um yeah essentially um Hopefully the autopilot will be working 24 hours a day and then only tweaking things as I go. Um, but yes, yeah, sleeping is kind of a debated, you know, a topic that's pretty debated amongst sailors. Um, people say that single-handed sailors aren't being good seamen and not practicing good seamanship um, due to the fact that somebody is not on watch all the time. Um, and it's pretty heated. Sometimes people get really into it and, you know, some people really are against it and some people are really for it and say it's just as safe. And there's, it seems to be shown that more people crash um, with crew than, you know, with, with the one person. But sleeping, essentially, yeah, I'd leave it up to the autopilot and go down below. And um, when I'm near shipping lanes or any like heavy, more heavy traffic area. Um, I only allot myself 25 minutes of sleep at a time and basically set an egg timer and hit that and wake up. And I just try to act like I'm just using the restroom in the middle of the night and just barely awake, just scan for any lights, scan, you know, around, like check your course and go right back to sleep. One thing that I, I kept thinking of is as you're sailing, what if there's just no wind. What do mm. you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's usually the most miserable time for sailors. Um, way more so than uh, big storms. People write about that endlessly. I've yet to read a book from an experienced sailor that says storms are worse than the doldrums. Uh, no wind. Um, it's just, uh, it's very disheartening. I've only experienced no wind um, a while trying to get somewhere um only a few times when my motor wasn't working and it was pretty yeah it's pretty miserable and just like all day affair of just bobbing around and everything's just flailing and making horrible sounds and you're like yeah it's just not good you're just of cork in the water and nothing in sight and yeah yeah it's pretty miserable so you're just waiting for the wind to pick up basically yeah, essentially, which happens a lot more around the middle, of, around the equator. Um, so in the Atlantic there, um, that's where I'll be most likely experiencing be calming. But the Southern Ocean is also known for just very uh, volatile, um, emotional <laughs> uh, seas as well from being very violent seas. And then all of a sudden just nothing. And that's pretty exhausting. So next question, I guess, would be, Throughout the journey of, with your knowledge of the different different regions, are there any that you're looking forward to more or less sailing in? Mm. I mean, I've never been in the Southern Ocean. I've never sailed there. Um, so I'm looking forward to experiencing it, which is most of the race. So good thing I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, maybe near Australia, just because... Yeah. I don't know. It seems cool <laughs> I don't know. And, and interesting and not as uh, cold and miserable, hopefully, but I'm not really looking for, I'm looking forward to rounding Cape Horn, which is um, South America tip. Um, looking forward to seeing that land and seeing it in my rear view mirror, if you will. And um, that will be, I don't know, that'll probably be the most emotional experience like ever. Yeah. yeah. Passing by. Yeah, right. Because that's just the most feared area on this on this route. Um, that whole southern part is called the Roaring Forties, basically underneath Latitude Forty, um, which is a lot of the race. But um, 
it just gets really, really violent. Lots of constant winds and, um, right there specifically, you're so close to Antarctica and, um, yeah, the storms just blow through really, really crazy. And yeah, it's pretty intimidating. <laughs> Big seas, you know, from anywhere from 10 to 30 foot seas are regular there. Yeah. Um, so uh, just a quick thought thinking of like rough waters and that sort of thing. Um, you mentioned emergency equipment. How, so with that equipment, what's the procedure if you do hit like really rough water? Like what's, what, what steps do you go through? Yeah, there's a couple different technique ideas that people tend to um, argue about. And one um, technique that I've employed in the past is just heaving to, which is backwinding the front sail and then letting the mainsail flog, um, which essentially stalls the boat and allows the waves to kind of roll under you. Um, there's other ideas that when you have huge following seas and huge winds, um, that you don't want the boat sitting still when the seas are breaking. So if the wave is breaking, you don't want to be a, a sitting duck. So heaving two is a little more looked down on because um, you can be at the top and then you just get knocked over really easy. Um, you know, the boat being a sailboat, if you don't know, they always write, uh, they always write themselves because of the keel on the bottom of the boat is very heavy. Um, and yeah, so essentially, um, it's just to run, surf the waves and to drag warps or um, drogues, which are parachutes behind your boat in the water and it slows your boat down enough, but you're still making progress and um, keeping an angle to the wave. So if it's right behind you and you're surfing down it, you go to the side of it a little bit. Um, yeah, definitely don't try to fight the waves. You'd rather be going backwards than going under. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um you mentioned earlier uh, food, mm -hmm. nine months or was it six to? Yeah, six to nine months, yeah. Um, so what kind of food are you packing? Um, I think I'm going to try to do half dehydrated meals and then half like canned stuff. And um, yeah, I haven't really gotten that too far into it yet, to be honest. But um, probably whatever anybody's willing to donate, I'll take. And then um, probably do a nice food drive or something. But um yeah food is pretty big to me i think eating healthy is very important and especially in, in a race of that caliber so i plan on not bringing junk food at all and um the unfortunate thing is i won't have access to fresh fruit or vegetables um but i will be bringing sprouts and um sprouting oh yeah some microgreens so on the boat growing them in a, in a little little pot yeah exactly yeah um that will be my source of fresh greens which will probably be pretty minute but yeah. what about water Would, are you bringing just a lot of like bottled water or do you have some filtration system or something like that yeah we're not allowed to have modern um desalinators which is pretty common nowadays but um i will be having um they like fil regular you know water filters on and already uh, installed on the boat but yeah i'm going to have to you're required to catch rainwater because there's no way you're going to have enough water at the start line um unless the whole boat is water tanks but um so collecting rainwater is pretty simple on a sailboat really um as long as your sail is up which it will be pretty much the whole time um you let the rain wash off the salt on the sails and on the deck for a little bit. And then what I've done in the past is drilled holes on the bottom of my boom, um, which is what the mass, what the sail is attached to the big metal pole that swings around and all the water hits the sail drains down into the boom, which is hollow. And then you hang buckets up on each side of the end of the boom. And that just drains into your five gallon buckets and being such a big sail area, um it fills up those buckets in a heartbeat um so that's one system and other people just set up little tarps in the cockpit or around the boat and have funnels attached to the tarps and funnel into cans okay. um yeah so a little simpler than you would imagine yeah actually have um a berkey water system which is um and powerful enough to 
take pond water and filter it and make it drinkable. Um, but it's also in like a very not robust, like it'll, it'll get trash on the boat as of right now. So I'm trying to think of a way to keep that on board and also, and like make it on a gimbal system. So it swivels with the turning and tossing of the boat. Um, so I'll probably install one of those or install that in the boat permanently. Um, cause I like it so much. Okay, so what experience you have sailing in stormy seas? Yeah, um, extreme storming seas, not as much. Um, I've sailed in several gales and storms that have been really brief encounters with like strong fronts coming through the Bahamas. Um, at the time, my old small boat was, uh, it was also very strong and sturdy, but uh, a lot smaller than this one. Um <clears throat> I didn't have any modern equipment on that pretty much, just not by choice, <laughs> by limited re funds. Um, so I never had weather updates or anything. So I just kind of went for it. And most people thought I was nuts, but um, I was like, well, you know, people have been doing this for a long time. I'm not going that far. Usually it'd only be a hundred miles or so at the most. And um, yeah, I've encountered some pretty bad fronts, but nothing like insane that have lasted a long time usually enough where I just take down the sails, you minimize your sails. And I've never had to tow a warp or a drogue uh, lines behind the boat to slow myself down. Um, Cause usually the seas aren't long enough build up at that point. Um, so yeah, pretty minimal to be quite honest um, enough to, you know, have no sails up at one point, um, you know, that maybe 40 knots of wind or so, but um Besides that, not, not as much. You ever lost a mast? I have never lost a mast, um, but I am required to know how to rig up a jerry rig um, for the race rules, which I'm supposed to be doing in about two weeks when I go on the water. I'm immediately setting up a system where, yeah, basically if the mast gets lost, then I need to know how to still keep the boat moving um, in case of that. So my idea is I've mounted two um, mounts where my spinnaker pulls, which, you know, help boom out a sail. Um, these big metal poles essentially will be hoisted and with blocks and tackles to make an A-frame. And um, then I'll sail and, and whatever sails I have at that time um, in a horizontal fashion. Um, that's kind of the idea that I've, thought of and i've seen work um i'm also planning on having a liberty kite um on board which is a new idea i mean an old idea but newly fashioned um uh, a british company actually makes them and they really are really simple it's been, if you've ever seen kite surfers um it's the same thing um but a bigger scale so basically flying a big kite off of your bow and your stern cleats um and, and there's two control lines that allow you to keep your boat moving without any rigging up which is you know i think way smarter than having because the likelihood if i lose my mass i'm also probably going to lose a pole um is my thought which is what happened in the last race to two racers um one specific lost her mass and lost everything on the deck including her spinnaker poles um so she had no way to make for the progress, but if she had a small kite that was compacted in her boat, she could have just set that up and kept going to, to safety. Yes. Yeah. Unless you have severe neglect on, um, broken parts on the mast or on the rigging, um, usually a knockdown or a rollover or at the worst, they call it pitch pulling when the, it goes end over end. Yeah. So you're asking about any encounters with like, uh, sea life, other sailors, whales. whales, anything you could possibly encounter out there. Yeah. 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 I've never come across any pirate like encounters. Um, thankfully, um, I think it's becoming more and more rare, but, um, probably not in certain areas, but I haven't been to those certain areas. Um, but encounters. Yeah. I mean, lots of tons of whales a lot especially on the west coast near san francisco up and down the west coast there 
um, lots of humpbacks, sometimes a little bit too close to comfort because they're as big as the boat and if not bigger. And yeah, seeing one of those like either completely almost jump or at least splash its big tail or, you know, spout in front of you is pretty wild and beautiful. But um, lots of dolphins. Um, I, I do eat fish, so I fish a lot off the, I just drag lines, um, when I'm sailing. Um, I've never noticed sharks while sailing. Uh, I will, I've noticed some weird things like big buoys getting dragged the opposite direction of current and, and like, you know, like out in the middle of the ocean, not like near where, you know, a lobster trap would be. So that was weird. And my buddy was convinced that it was attached to like you know, a giant megalodon shark that has been dragging this buoy for like years. <laughs> um, what's that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, while sailing, those are my main encounters. Um, f- weird stories with fish actually in the Bahamas, there was a, mo- this is kind of a sidetrack, but it is a good story. Cool. Um, I was sailing, it was storming really bad one night and I actually had friends on the boat at the time and we were anchored. We thought safely behind an island and then the front clocked around and spun all the way around and started coming from the other side. So all of a sudden now my boat is on the side of the island where the wind is hitting. So essentially if my anchor starts to drag, then I'll be beached or you know hit a reef or something there. It's more likely. So I started to feel the anchor drag in the middle of the night. So I was like, oh, dang it. So we got to get up and it's bucking. There's waves everywhere and not, nothing bad, just choppy. And, you know, 2 a.m. in the middle of the night and everyone's, you know, really mad at me for <laughs> making them get up and hearing the engine going. So we start motoring around to the other side of the island. And I was like, you know what? Let's just pull into the marina. Like, we have enough money for one night stay, or we'll just get up early before they show up. And we'll just leave. And um, so we go into this, we start to pull in this marina. And my buddy Steven's like, I don't know, man. I think we should just anchor out. Like, I got a bad feeling about this marina. And I was like, I don't know why. Like, so we start to go in. Then all of a sudden, last second, I only have like a few headlamps on this old boat. And we see like these pilings that are not charted on any of my charts and they're just like sticking out jagged, like broken, all these like weird rocks in the way. And I'm like, we're making all these evasive turns. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm about to hold my boat. Like, you know, we're close to land. So it's not like we're going to die, but you know, I'm just, it could be a tragic ending to that boat and our trip. And so I'm like, we decided not to go in there and there's a back entrance and I'm like, I'm bent on going in. I'm so like, you know, head, strong and stubborn at times and my buddy steven is like dude i wish you would just trust me (laughs) and i'm like i'm like no man we it's fine we're gonna get in and it'll be fine and so we start going around we go the back way and then all of a sudden all these fish and they're like they're like needle nose fish they weren't flying fish but they were these weird needle nose fish that i feel like i've never actually seen before at, at the time just start launching out of the water. Like, like at first it sounded like rain and they're just coming out from the direction of the Marina that we're going to in the middle of the night. And we have all these lights. I'm like, what the hell is going on over there? And like, he's like, dude, what is going? And just like thousands, I'm not exaggerating at all. Like enough to fill this whole room, like just like start swimming out of the Marina at our boat into the wind. And like, it's just like, and they start landing on the boat and they start like stabbing us. Like I literally am driving the boat in the cockpit and like they're landing in the cockpit and I'm like bleeding on my arm because their, their noses are so sharp, like needles and just like doing, doing, doing. And everyone's like, like sweeping them off the deck. And, I, and Steven and I like looked up at the same time. He's on the bow, like trying to steer us in. And he's just like, and I was like, we both just knew like, it just was not meant to be. And that was like the overwhelming sign. And sure enough, the next day we wait for the morning light to go in to feel up and grab some breakfast or something, something. And we go in and we start to make our way through that back entrance. And there were like all these like shallow, like rocks that weren't charted as well, like covering the entrance, like right after it. And that we would have for sure ran into. Are you going to have a free time for it? <laughs> 
Yeah, I'm actually allowed to have a fridge. Um, and I'm planning on bringing one. I have one built into the boat right now, but the compressor was tossed because it was from 1978 or something and it was leaking everywhere. It was horrible. So I'm refitting a compressor still. Older radio. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm required. Not allowed to have radar. I have, um, I'm required to have two separate Ecomax uh, radar reflectors that amplify my boat about you know, three times bigger than it is, um, along with AIS transceivers, um, basically just, which is a, a way to alert other boats that I'm nearby and I'll have alarms set up when some come within a certain range um, because I'm not allowed to see, like I'm not allowed to use a screen to see AIS, which is what's on everybody's boats now but I'm allowed to transmit it so other people can see me. Um, I'm actually not going to be communicating with my family directly, except for those three checkpoints. Um, I am required to do a satellite phone call with the team, the race committee doctor every week. Um, yeah. Like health check-ins? Yes, exactly. Okay. And I also have one-way trackers, so you guys will be able to follow every day of where I'm at on the map. What'd you say? My family? <laughs> yeah, actually, yes. My dad is extremely supportive. Um, I think I've always done things kind of like this. Like, haven't crossed the Atlantic before. Haven't done anything insane sailing-wise. <laughs> um, but that's been kind of my whole life um, ever since I was a kid, just trying to do things that were way out of my element i think and just going for it and it always seemed to work out and uh, maybe i'm really lucky and we have some really good angels watching over me i have no idea but um i think he's just learned to trust me and where i feel called to go and <clears throat> yeah so my family's supportive when you catch fish how do you prepare it it depends on the fish uh, if it's tuna then i'll absolutely absolutely eat it raw and you know package it properly so the other golden globe racers um are they are they friendly are they open to giving advice that sort of thing yeah actually most of them not all of them <laughs> but i would say 80 percent of them have been so helpful i've asked so many questions to a few of them specific that i've taken a liking to um or maybe taken a liking to me um <laughs> yeah and some of them like i'm also like yeah and you're not that prepared either that makes me feel better but um most of them seem to be very you know they've been planning for this for three or four years since the last one in 2018 um but yeah i've I, there's a facebook group where we're all involved in and it gets used almost every at least every week and usually by me every week <laughs> So how many racers are, are there in the Golden Globe race? And how many of them is this their first race like yours is? Um, I actually don't have a good number of how many people it's their first time. Um, I think about five are doing it again um, from 2018. But only two of those people actually finished, um, I think is what it is. Yeah, there should be about 25. I think just two just dropped out this past week. Oh, they dropped out. Okay. Yeah, so you have Daniel and Doug that are out. And then another guy, I don't know if they've put it out yet, but um, somebody else, Mike J.H. Smith, um, I think just dropped out. Um, Do you think you see that? Like, by myself the first i think the first few days there's a good chance of me being near them but if you think about it in the sense of like driving on a highway somebody's going 82 miles an hour you're going 80 in a minute you already can't see them so stretch that out within thousands of miles um but yeah i think the last race somebody finished within like a couple of weeks of each other or like within a week of each other which is pretty incredible um and then the next person was like a month after. So, when yeah. The first person pulls in to the finish line, like historically in the race. How long 
does it take for like the last person to follow them? What's the what's that window? Usually about a, a month is what it's been was in 2018 was the biggest range, I think. Um, except for there was an outlier um, who was actually in the race again, Tapio. He had really, really bad barnacle growth. Um, there he's at the bottom. Um, yeah, Finland. Um, he had horrible barnacle growth on his paint on the bottom and just slowed him down so significantly. Like when you, if you were to Google photos of his finish and they pulled the boat out of the water, I mean, it looked like, like the boat has been in the water for a hundred years. I mean, there was like inches and inches of barnacles, but I don't know what bottom paint he is. He doesn't just tell anybody, I don't think, but he's obviously not using it for this race, but he finished though. He was an, he's an incredible sailor and really, really sweet person and really kind. And he was like two or at least two or three months behind the finisher, like 90 days or something. My, my, my mom grew up in Jacksonville beach. Um, and I grew up mostly in Tampa, but I have a lot of family in Jacksonville beach that I grew up visiting. And I, that's why I came back here after I found out I was accepted in the race. So <laughs> yeah, oh, I need all sorts of help. Um, I'm always taking volunteers to work on the boat. The boat goes in the water in two weeks. Um, I am kind of prepared for that as of right now i'm waiting on uh, a propeller to be rebuilt it's in the oasis uh, marina and boatyard it's off of riberia street but yeah i'm always seeing volunteers on that side um a lot of it deals with well it's kind of varies all every day but um yeah i'm always looking for help with that i'm also you know anybody online or whatever as well i'm i look f- I'm really not great with social media, hence why I'm doing a retro race in the first place. Um, you know, like I, I really don't like technology all that much. So I am looking for help in the department of reaching out for sponsors. Um, as you can imagine, all those satellite phones and emergency equipment cost an insane amount of money, um, more so than I even realized. <laughs> and now that the boat is in the water and I just keep committing and sacrificing all these different parts of my life to stay in the race, um, is I'm also realizing how, like I'm getting closer, but I'm also like, I'm realizing more and more details as I, as I can focus on them that I'm also really far still. Um, and unfortunately a lot of it is monetary, um, issues. Have you ever had any, so I've thought about this. I'm, I love the ocean, but I'm kind of uncomfortable right out in the middle, you know, mm. not being able to see the land. Have you had to overcome any of those fears? Have you always been really comfortable with the ocean, like psychologically? That aspect? Yeah, I, it's crazy. Every time you go away from land, um, the first day it's all exciting and you're like, the heart starts pumping and you're like, I can't see land anymore. It's so wild. Like I'm just totally out here and then for me what seems to happen is day two I wake up and I'm like oh my gosh I'm like I just start to purge everything you start to like think about all the relationships in your life and good ones and bad ones and all these weird feelings and good feelings and bad ones and and fears and things that you regret or whatever because there's just so much room to navigate that literally and in a mental space to do that. Cause you got nothing else going on and nowhere to be. Um, and that for a while was like the craziest rush. And then day three, it seems that I kind of like settle back down and I'm like, now this is life. <laughs> like I got, I, you know, I screamed and cried a lot yesterday and now I'm just like, Everything is okay. Hallucinations at sea. I've heard that can happen. Has that ever happened to you? Um, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> it could have been really, really good vivid ones. Um, maybe those fish didn't happen. I don't know. Um, no, I, I, I know that's a, a very strong possibility. And there's a few books that touch on that, um, like Voyage for madman is uh for madman which is about the original 1968 golden globe race um hence on that and a few people talk about that in their own works as well i think chichester 
a famous sailor um, who did circumnavigate by himself and stopped only one time. Um, talked about that. Um, my experience with it has been I haven't. Um, it is something I think about, though. Sometimes I think about, like, am I going to lose my mind out there? Yeah, I think that's a reasonable fear. I think the benefit of having the boat is that I can, I can keep, like, you start to realize that stories are so important in our lives. And like, you can, for me, reading has, it it does that tenfold. Like you feel like you can actually connect to somebody or something without being next to them and you can kind of dive in. So it kind of just keeps me from my very limited experience of only eight days alone at one time, you know, then I relied on books heavily for my social interactions of sorts. And I think other people have said the same, you know, other racers or other sailors that have inspired me, like Bernard Matissier, um, his book, The Long Way. He talks about how, like, you know, basically why would he need any other company? Like he's got like Shakespeare and he's got all these greats like that he's brought with him. And um, these people are far more fascinating than the people he usually consults with. (laughs) That's the book that inspired me to do the race. When I read that, I knew I wanted to do it. But Bernard, it was, uh, a, uh, he was a poet. And um, yeah, it changed my life, that book, for sure. So have you thought about having friends or family write you letters that you can read out, out to sea? Maybe keeping one per day or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I love that idea. Um, I've had, <clears throat> at the last fundraiser I had in Jacksonville, I actually somebody spurred the idea of that and they a lot of the people there started writing letters and i have them in a book saved um but there'll probably be a lot more i would love that (laughs) yeah i will read them i can tell you that so if anyone wanted to follow you or watch you you mentioned we could track you Mm -hmm. yeah there'll be a link on my website which is just uh, skipper.com um to my live tracker when i have that up and I'm moving. Um, and then there also be on the golden globe race, which is golden globe race.com their website. They will have, um, live trackers of everybody. And basically they, when we do our medical calls once a week, they also send out the recording to whoever is, I decide to control my media and they are allowed to take little blips and tweet or Facebook status or Instagram or whatever, uh, what I'm, what's happening with me. I won't know what they do, but yeah. So you'll be able to hear my updates as it goes along. Um, and you'll just be able to click my name on the tracker on the little boat somewhere in the Atlantic or something. And it'll say like my most recent update, which is pretty cool. Um, so we meant, we talked earlier, um, based on one question about volunteers and help and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, with this race being such a huge undertaking, like what are some ways that people could support you in really any way? Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, multiple, um, the obvious one is financial that covers insurance, which is required in most of the safety gear and like new standing rigging, um, which I would like, but, um, that's bare poles. That's like so minimal. And I would, you know, if I could have more that I would, and I could spend it wisely. But besides that, I am also looking for help with, you know, media always, you know, I have a few friends that have donated a lot of time to making those cool videos that was playing earlier and that new one I just put out today. Um, and um, yeah, so those friends helped me a lot looking for volunteers work on the boat advice. If you know anybody that knows good maritime practices, um, you know, especially navigating, I'm happy to take classes. Um, and then other ways would be, I think it would be best interest. I hate that. I, I don't like attention that much. I don't like fear it, but I don't like it. Um, it seems a little dishonest at times, but unfortunately I need to be, I need the story to be heard to raise these funds and um and i want people to be inspired in some ways by feeling even if they are 
very underqualified or very, um, you know, that they can still achieve great things. You know, I, I hope that people can realize that and when there's something on your heart and it feels like destiny that you can do that. And usually from the help of others, thankfully. And, um, but just realizing that we can do anything we want, which is pretty beautiful. Have you gotten any sponsorships? Yeah, I actually have not gotten any. I've gotten some that people have sent me free stuff, like whale marine pumps have reached back out to me and sent me new build pumps, which is huge and awesome. But if I claim sponsorship on the boat, I owe a sponsorship fee to the race because their idea that they're basically going to be doing the advertising for me. So they should get a cut of it, which is fair uh, to an extent. doesn't help me, but the sponsorship fee is expensive. It's, you know, like 11 grand. So I have to make sure I cover 11 grand worth of cash or supplies in order to make that even worth it. Um, so I've been limiting, you know, sometimes people will want to send me stuff, but only for my level. I have on my, also on my website, I have, a, a, yeah, that presentation, Essentially, there's like four different levels I have named for um, ways of sponsorship. And one is, you know, like three grand to put your name on the side of the boat along the gunnels, which is on the top in a certain t format. And that would be also media exposure, et cetera. There's also talks that I'm in a documentary um, funded by the CB. S, this is Canada, Canada's broadcast service, I think. Is that what it is? It's like the PBS of Canada. Um, they're shooting a new documentary, and I've already been a part of that a good bit. Um, and then one of the focuses, there's also talk about they're trying to do a Netflix um, short documentary series, which would be instrumental to helping me get sponsors, but it wouldn't come until after the race. <laughs> so, you know, it's just, you know, hopefully not false promises to people. But yeah, I've been I've reached out to the probably hundreds of companies. There's also hundreds more I haven't, and that's somewhere where I I'm also taking volunteers and helping is basically just cold calling, you know, in a way, or just cold emailing people with um, that presentation, explaining you know a little bit of the story and um, ways that they can help because that that could be really beneficial if i land and you know the top one would be like i'm asking like something crazy like 60 grand <laughs> but you get to help name the boat so it'd be ups's second wind or you know Publix's second wind is what be the new name of the boat and written next to it and you get to reach pick the colors because at that point i'd paint the boat any color for that person or company um yeah not much uh, I don't win much, uh, if I win the race, uh, it used to be 50 grand, which again, not that much in the grand scheme of what we're, uh, you know, putting in, but now it's only like 10 or something or 10,000 euros. And they say it could go back up to 50 depending on their, uh, funds. Yeah, I don't, uh, that's a whole other thing that, but obviously I'm not doing it for <laughs> the winnings. So thoughts on writing a book when you finish? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love writing. Um, I've thought about it. I haven't, I'd want it to be something more than just like, here's an account of my time. Cause there's so many of that. I, and not that that's bad or wrong because everyone's account is, you know, special, but um, yeah, I, I definitely plan on something or even some kind of interactive piece i plan on shooting a lot of super eight and um taking a lot of audio sounds i want to record a lot with the cassette and even if i make like an album where or a movie with like voiceover and also just sounds or it's just probably be kind of weird and artsy and nobody would care but i don't know i would love to write a book as well i think um if i feel called to it but it's definitely on my radar Um, talked about this amazing journey and telling some funny, weird <laughs> stories about flying needle. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was, this was great. 
could we maybe have you back when you win the race? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys. I appreciate y'all.